Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the class on Romans, a study of the Book of Romans. Uh, welcome to our online students, our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on. And also welcome to our um, in-person students. Uh, thank you all for joining class this morning. We'll begin with a word of prayer. So can I ask one of our online students to lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Anyone would like to lead us in prayer? It's always our in-person students who are leading. Can we hear some online student pray? Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Gracious, loving Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this day. No, we can't hear time. you, Nina. Oh, okay. And now we can so hear I... you. Yes. Now we can hear you. Okay. Gracious, loving Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this day and this time that you have given us to come to you, to spend time with you in your presence, with your word. We commit each one of us, Lord, into your hands. Uh, come it, Pastor Selina, into your hands, Lord. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will open our eyes of understanding and you will throw light, Lord. Your word says that the entrance of your word always brings light. We pray that we will be sensitive to what you're saying to us. We would learn and we would grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. For we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Nina, John. So yesterday we began studying Romans chapter. <laughs> Not 6, 7. Start, uh, started uh, chapter 7. Okay. So we saw that the main point that he was saying in verses 1 to 6 is that he's getting the Jewish believers to understand that we are not under the law anymore, that we are free from the law, because now we are under grace. What does he say in chapter 7? We are no longer under the law, but we are now part of the body of Christ. Okay, so we are serving God in the newness of the spirit. We are serving God in the newness of the spirit. And then in verses uh, 7 to 12, he goes on to talk about the law and the struggle with sin. Okay, uh, we finish looking at that as well till verse 12. So we'll continue from verses 13 to verse 20. So can one of you please read uh, Romans chapter 7, verses 13 to 25, please? Romans chapter 7, reading from verse 13. But how can that be? Did the law which is good cause my death? Of course not. Sin used, that, sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purpose. So the trouble is not with the law, but it is spiritual and for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me. For I am all too human, a slave to sin. Which I version are you reading? NLT. Oh, that's why it's different. Can oh. I change it, man? Yeah, NKJV, if you read, it will help all of us, please, if you don't mind. Thank you. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin that it might appear sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me nothing good dwells, for two will is present with me, 
but how to perform what is good i do not find for the good that i will to do i do not do but the evil i will not to do that i practice now if i do what i will not to do it is no longer i who do it but sin that dwells in me i find then a law that evil is present with me the one who will to do, wills to do good for i delight in the law of god according to the inward man but i see another law in my members warning against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members o wretched man o wretched man that i am who will deliver me from this body of death i thank god through jesus christ our lord so then with the mind i myself serve the law of god but with the flesh the law of sin amen when you read this what were your thoughts <laughs> as he was reading this what were your thoughts ha huh? confusion looks like you're reading some philosopher who's writing his philosophy okay it's confusion it's not very clear but um, it is it's powerful okay it is not confusion uh, the writer knows what he is writing and he is writing it with the inspiration of the holy spirit and it is just uh, uh, revealing truths and it is powerful so we'll study it okay uh, so in verses 13 to 25 paul describes his struggle he's basically talking about his uh, struggle okay so paul has already uh, mentioned to us that the what did the law do the law highlighted sin or it made a person know that they have broken a commandment they have broken a law they have sin done something that is against god okay but he's asking this question then is the law evil is the law not good okay is the law bad or uh, the question here he says in verse 13 has then what is good become death to me so is the law bringing death to me though it is good so he's saying hey the problem is not with the law he's already told us the what is the law how does he describe the law in the previous uh, verses law is good ah yes the law is holy in in verse 12 he concludes the law is good holy and is righteous and just okay so he's saying there's no problem with the law the law is holy it's spiritual is just it's right but there is sin and sin is working in my flesh and it's working through my natural desires so in these verses we see a struggle that is inside paul he says i want to do what is right but i don't do it right like most of us we want to do what is right we don't want to those of us who want to get angry we don't want to get angry we don't want to shout we don't want to scream we don't want to use any words but we are not able to control our selves uh, of it okay so he says i want to do what is right but i don't do it i desire to please god but i don't do it and he says why is that he says in verse 21 what is he saying in verse 21 he says that i find a law that evil is present with me the one who wills to do good okay so he's saying i i find a law a law here is not the law of god the law that he gave to moses he's not talking about that law he's saying the law here he's saying the law that is uh, that's a controlling dominating a force that is controlling and dominating okay so he's saying that there is a law that is controlling me and what is that is controlling me that is evil that is present in me the evil the sin that is present in me it's controlling me it's dominating me it's getting me to do things that i don't want to do it's becoming a force it's a force something that's overpowering controlling and dominating me and he says what is this that is dominating me it's sin it's the evil that is in me okay and so in verse 23 he's saying it's keeping this law this force this dominating thing is keeping the members of my body members of the body means what parts of my body 
okay, whether it's your mind, your will, your emotions, whatever, it's keeping it enslaved to sin. Even though my mind wants to obey God, but my flesh, the law in my flesh, the controlling, dominating force that is in my flesh, it is keeping me enslaved to the things of the flesh. Okay, verse 24, he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? So he's asking who will deliver me from this body of death? Why is he saying who will um, deliver me from this uh, body of death? Why is he calling it a body of death? Because what does sin produce? Death. Okay, it's not just a spiritual and physical death, but everything between sin and death is like death, right? Whether it is oppression in our mind, depression, it's sadness, brokenness, bondages, whether it's health, all of this is eventually leading to decay, corruption in our body, physical weakness, physical decay, physical corruption. So he's saying, and he's saying that, you know, this evil, the sin that is controlling me, you know, is producing death in my body. And he's also mentioned this in verse 13. He says, the more he sins, the more death is being produced in it, in my body, right? For example, the more a person sins, the more unhappy that person is, whether it's jealousy, hatred, pride, whether they're indulging in any wrong activities, whether it's addictions, whatever, the more they're doing it, what is it going to produce? More bondages, more strongholds, more, you know, uh, unhealthiness in the mind, more weakness, uh, sadness, disappointment, frustration, depression. So he's saying the more one person sins, the more it's producing death. And he's saying his body has become a body of death because of what sin has done. Why? Because sin is controlling his body because his body is being controlled by sin. So the more he is going to let his body be dominated and controlled by sin, that is producing death which is at work in his body. He's seeing his body decaying, you know, physical weakness and all of those things. In verses 13 to 25, you know, uh, is a question that most scholars, which I started this chapter, I told you, right? Most scholars and common ri commentary writers debate whether what Paul is mentioning in verses 13 to 25 is descriptive of Paul's life as a believer after he's accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, or is it Paul's life as a man under the law before he was saved, before he became a believer? So that is the big question. And so, you know, many believers take this point of view that, hey, Paul is talking this about a life as a believer after he is unsaved. And so many people quote this verse this with, with their, you know, with their struggle to sin, with their, you know, uh, which, because this verse is described their struggle to sin. And they say, okay, it's okay. You know, Paul struggled with sin. To, you know, because sin was dominating his flesh, I too am struggling. It's okay. He wanted to do good. He could not do it. I'm also in the same boat as him. I also want to do good, but I can't do it. There's nothing that we can do. God only save us. Okay. So that is like a stand which many believers take because they say that this, this is what Paul is telling about his life after he becomes a believer. Okay, but I want to point out a couple of things which I already have done in the introduction, but I reiterate here. Paul is not talking about his life here in verses 13 to 25. He's not talking about his life before he was born again. Uh, you know, sorry, he's not talking about his life after he was born again, but he's talking about his life before he was born again, when he was under the law. And we read about this, we saw this in verse 9, where he says, when the commandments came, means when I came to know the law, sin came up and I died. That means when I came to an age where I'm able to understand, hey, you know, right and wrong is not just right and wrong to get rewards, you know, and, uh, you know, chocolates or points or whatever. Right and wrong is in my relationship with God. And when I break a law, it is actually sinning against 
God, you know, and then when I sin against God, I know that I have grieved him, that is sin. And so he says sin came up and when sin came up, he knows that, you know, it is bringing every kind of decay and death in his body. So he's saying this, he's talking about this experience when he is under the law, not after he was born again. So death here means anything that decays, that corrupts and that destroys our body or our mind or our emotions. And the second thing I want to bring uh, to our attention here, he concludes by saying, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That means he's pointing to the way out of this weakness of the flesh, this law of sin, this, this, uh, this sin that dominates, that controls, that, you know, is a overwhelming force that causes him to sin. He's saying, I'm pointing a way out of that. He says, I feel trapped, but this is the way out. He's not saying that, hey, I took the way out. That means I have accepted Jesus Christ. I've been born again. I've come out of the law. I've come out of sin. I've come now into Jesus Christ. I'm now on the other side, but I still find myself trapped. No, that is not what he says. You know, he says that before he's come to the other side, before he's received salvation, before he is in Christ, he was under the law and he says that is when he was trapped with sin. Because he says that time I want to do what is right. I want to do what is good because he knew the law, right? He's, an, he's somebody who studied the Old Testament. He was very zealous about the Old Testament. He said, I want to do the right things in the law. But, and I want to do what the law is telling me, but I find sin is controlling my body and I'm not able to rid myself of this sin that is controlling my body and my desires. And then he finds the way out. And what is the way out? That is Jesus Christ. So that is why I say that the experience that he is talking about in verses 13 to 25 does not apply to a believer because the believer is on the other side and it is Paul's experience when he was under the law and before coming to Jesus. So some people don't see it as we see it. So I'm sharing this with you. You are free to take the position that you feel comfortable with after reading Romans chapter 7 or your understanding, your study of Romans 7. But this is my take. This is our understanding that he's not talking about, you know, the sin that controls once we are, you know, uh, uh, believers. Yes, because he's all, why am I saying that? Because he's already told us in chapter six that as believers, we are dead to the, we are dead to sin. We're no longer, you know, the power of sin is broken over our lives. You know, sin no longer dominates our body. Sin no longer controls our body. We are dead to sin. We are alive in Christ Jesus. That is what he's already mentioned to us in chapter uh, 6 and chapter 5 as well. Okay. So you are willing to take, uh, uh, you know, you can take whatever stand you want to take your stand on with this understanding. But this is our stand that he's talking about his life, you know, before he was born again. And after he's born again, he's saying, thanks be to Jesus Christ, because it is Jesus Christ, our Lord, who can deliver us from this dominion, this law of sin that brings death. Okay. So in verse 25, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So here there are two things that have to be dealt with. Okay. In this chapter, the law has already been dealt with. Okay. He says we are dead to the law. Those who are believers, he says, we are dead to the law and we are married to Christ. That means we are one with Christ. We are in union with Christ. We are in Christ. But what is the other thing that we need to deal with? The law of sin and the law of death. The law of sin means the control, the dominion, the power of sin. And the law of death means the control, the power and the dominion of death. Okay, so he says in verse 9, he's already told us, sin revived and I died. Okay, so he's talking about sin and death. And in verse 13, he says, sin is producing death in me, ultimately physical and spiritual death. Verse 17, he says, sin dwells in me. 
verse 23 he says the law of sin which is at uh, in the members of my body which means the the power the control of sin that is controlling my body and what is the result verse 24 the body of death sin in my body is causing my body to die and verse 25 he talks about the law of sin now why am i pointing out to all of these verses because paul is saying hey there are two problems here. What are the two problems here in these verses? What are the two problems? What is the two problems? Just two words, one, one word each. What are the two problems? Sin. And what is the other problem? Death. Okay. So in these verses, like I said, verse 9, sin and death. Verse 13, sin is producing death. Verse 17, sin dwells in me. Verse 23, the law of sin, which is at members of my body, is controlling uh, the, my body to sin. Verse 25, for the body of death. Sin is in my body, is causing my body to die. Verse 25, the law of sin. So here he's pointing these verses, two problems. What are the two problems? Sin and death. And so he's saying, who is going to set me free from this sin that is controlling my flesh and ultimately producing death in me, whether it is physical death or spiritual death. Remember, he's talking about this, the life before, you know, a, uh, he's a believer. Okay. And then he says, what is it? It is, what is this that is controlling my body? What is it that is producing death? Who is going to deliver me from what I'm going through? And how do I come out of this? Now, why is this important? Because in the light of what Paul has already said in Romans chapter 6, okay, there is one connection point, uh, Romans chapter 6 verse 19. He says, I'm speaking to you because of the weakness of the flesh. Are you all able to understand? Yes, here he's basically saying that there are two problems. One is sin and one is death. And then he's asking who is going to set me free from the sin that is controlling my flesh and is ultimately, ultimately producing death in me. And he's also asking who is going to deliver me or how am I going to come out of this? Okay. So why is this important in the light of what Paul has already said in Romans 6? Remember I said in the introduction, when we are studying, we do the backward view and the forward view. So now we are in forward in chapter 7, but we will look at the, you know, have a backward view to understand this. So in Romans chapter 6, you know, there's one connecting point. He says in verse 19, I'm speaking to you because of the weakness of the flesh so he says there is the weakness in the flesh of a believer and what is it he says sin is at work sin is producing death sin if it is allowed to continue in the flesh will still produce death so then he's saying how can a believer who is set free how does he walk free from sin that produces death in the flesh so the answer he is giving is in chapter 8. Okay. So when we study chapter 8, uh, we would receive the answers. But just kind of summarizing what's there in your notes, what Paul states from his own experience and spiritual journey, the struggles he's saying is what I am doing, I do not understand, verse 17. What I will to do that I do not practice. What I hate to do, that I do. All this he says in verse 17. Then the other struggles he says is, I want to do good, but I'm unable to do it. Verse 18. The good that I will to do, I do not do it. Verse 19. The evil I will not do, that I practice. Verse 19. And then he also mentions the problems in verses 17, 18, 20, 21, and 23. What is the problems he mentions here? He says, sin dwells in me, verse 17. In my flesh, nothing good dwells, verse 18. Sin that dwells in me is verse 20. Evil is present with me, verse 21. And something is ruling in the members and fighting against my mind and bringing me to captive to sin was 23.
So in verse 23, Paul is mentioning a fight against his mind. And this is, uh, you know, also stated in what uh, Paul, First Peter writes in First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. He says, abstain from fleshly lust that war against your soul. Your soul means your mind, your will, and your emotions, right? So that is the struggles and the problem he is facing. And even as he is closing this part of his letter. He's, there's a desperate cry. You know, he's being disgusted by sin dwelling in, in human flesh. And he's also crying out for deliverance from this body of death or this body that is doomed to death, you know, because he's saying that sin is at work in my body and it controls my body and it's pulling down my body and the final outcome is death and he mentions the answer what is the answer jesus christ okay um so you know while paul is saying yes i have submitted to god's rule i'm aware there is a law of sin or a rule or dominion in my uh, in my flesh that is sin that is controlling me but god has the answer how to get rid of this sin that controls, that overpowers, that dominates the sin that produces death. And he is presenting the answer here. He's saying it is through Jesus Christ. But he goes on to also present it to us in Romans 8 when he talks about the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of life, who will help us to live according to God's uh, laws. Okay. So that is chapter 7 for us. Any questions? Any questions? No questions. I hope it's not like a confusion still in your minds and heads, like a puzzle or some philosophical things that truths that are you know, things that are stated. Yeah, Chaya is saying something. Can we understand this way? Spirit is willing, but flesh is not. Yes, the sp yes Paul also says, you know, the spirit is... Uh, uh, willing, but the flesh is weak. So that is why when we are, um, you know, born again, we need to, you know, every day, Jesus says, you have to crucify the flesh, the desires of the flesh. And you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And also we need to work out our salvation every day with fear and trembling. Why? Because of uh, the, the carnal nature, the the things of the flesh that, you know, um, that control us. And also what Paul is saying that, uh, or, you know, Peter is writing in First Peter that, you know, uh, the fleshly lust war against our soul. And also Paul is writing in Galatians where he's saying that there is, you know, the war between the flesh and the spirit. That we need to heed and listen to the spirit, and then we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, destroy or crucify the desires of our flesh. Yeah. Thank you, Chaya. Anyone else has any questions? Okay, if not, we will move on to chapter 8. Okay, the spirit of life. Just a few uh, things as a recap before we study this wonderful, powerful uh, uh, Romans chapter 8, which has powerful uh, truths. I don't know how many of you love Romans 8, but I love Romans 8. Okay, so in Romans chapter 5 and 6, Apostle Paul introduces us to the truth of our identification. Do you remember that? The truth of our identification, yes. So in Romans chapter 5, he presents to us how every human being is identified through Adam, 
through Adam, sin came. So we identify with Adam's sin. And also it came condemnation and judgment and everything that leads to death. But this Adam is a type and the shadow of the real man, Jesus Christ, through whom we received the free gift of grace, righteousness, salvation, eternal life, justification that gives us the ability to rule and reign. So that is what we looked at in chapters 5 and also chapter 6. And in chapter 6, he takes us deeper into our identification where he says we identify with Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection, his, asc his ascension, exaltation, or seated at the right hand of the Father. And all this, he says, Paul is saying, it has meaning for us. In a sense, you know, these are various um, steps, you know, for, uh, or, you know, uh, 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 or these are various things that free us from various uh, aspects or the things that Adam has put us in bondage to. Okay. So being crucified means what? We are set free from the power of sin. Being buried means we are set free from the old life, from Adam's life. Being resurrected means we are given a brand new life of God, the Zoe life of God. Being raised up with Christ means, you know, Christ took out that influence of the darkness, took us out of that influence of the darkness of this, of the age, the, the, the age that we were living in and brought us into the kingdom of light, the, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, from the influence of the kingdom of darkness into the influence of the kingdom of light. And us being seated with Christ means that we are in a place of dominion and authority. You know, um, say, Adam put us in subjection uh, to sin, sickness, and death, and Christ put us in a place of authority and dominion. Okay, So the truth of identification is in Christ is a complete reversal of what Adam has put us in the fall. Okay, so our identity in Adam is a complete reversal to what Christ has purchased and received, or who we are, or the truth of our identification in Christ. Okay. Um, and the main theme of Romans 6 is that as believers, we can live free from sin. And then we looked at Romans chapter 7, when Paul states a problem there where he's talking about the weakness of the flesh. Okay. And he says, um, uh, you know, uh, it talks about the law of sin and death and how the evil desires are controlling our body and our soul. And also in Romans chapter 7, Paul is talking of himself as under the law where he does not have the life of God. And he has all of these desires to keep the law, to follow the law and please God. But he finds this law, this control, this dominating force that is controlling him, that even if he wants to keep the law, even when he wants to please God, even if he wants to fulfill the, uh, the law of God, he finds himself powerless to do it because of the law of sin that is controlling and dominating his body. Hence, he calls the law of sin as something that is controlling him, controlling his body. And he's saying that this is the state every person who is unsaved and who is not living under God. But in verse 25 of Romans chapter 7, Paul presents the answer. He says, how can we be free from that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the answer. And that he brings us now with all of this beautiful way he has presented these truths, he brings us to chapter 8. And Romans chapter 8 is a very powerful, very beautiful chapter for us as believers. It is telling us basically how we need to live our lives under the provision of our truth of our identification. So we can look at our truth of our identification in chapter 5 and chapter 6. We can look at what God has provided for us and God is saying, hey, I have done all this for you. You know, I've kept you in this place of authority and dominion. I've provided everything to you through Jesus Christ. So this is all something that is a positional truth. 
but romans chapter 8 tells us how we can walk in this experientially so all this time in 5 6 and 7 what he's talked about our truth of our identification it's spiritual truths it's spiritual understanding that we need to have but in romans chapter 8 he's telling us how we can walk in those truths that he has talk to us or our spiritual identification or the truth of our identification, how we can walk in that experientially. Okay. So we would look at Romans chapter eight verses one to um, 11. We will not be able to finish all the verses, uh, but we will see how much we can uh, do. Okay. So can somebody read verses uh, one to uh, one, two, and three, please, of Romans chapter eight. One, two. One, two, three. Romans chapter eight, one, two, three. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of the life is in Christ Jesus, has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on, according, on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Amen. So in Romans chapter 7, Paul has been talking about life without Christ and under the law. Now Paul is changing his focus to speaking about our life in Christ. And he's finding, uh, you know, he's saying he's finding it difficult to do good things he wants to do. So how does he make this shift? So he's presenting that in chapter 8. So he says in verse 1, therefore... There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So in these verses, Paul is talking of those who are in Christ Jesus. So he says, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Amen. There is no accusation. There is no charge that is brought against them or that can be held up against them. He says, we are totally free. Why is he saying that? Because he's, he's already told us in chapter 7 that sin, we uh, that we are dead to the law. We are no longer bound to the, the law. So Paul is saying that when we are under the law, the law completely condemns us, right? Right? When you are under the law, the law is very condemning. Why is the law condemning? Because when you don't do something, the law tells you, hey, you have broken the law. You're guilty. You have to go and uh, repent. You have to make such such offering in the temple. Okay? So that is what the law was doing. It was, you know, the law was completely condemning people. And we get that sense when we read Romans 7, when Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am. That means, you know, he's saying, I want to be good. I want to obey God. I want to keep the law, but I can't keep the law because I'm constantly breaking the law. So how is he looking at him? He's looking at him as a con condemned, wretched person. Because the law highlights sin and it leaves the person being condemned. And when the person feels condemned and guilty, they go to the temple and they offer their sacrifices as repentance. But he says, when we come to Christ, we are completely free from these feelings of condemnation and guilt and shame. So life in Christ sets us free from all condemnation. So as believers, we are no, live, no longer living under any condemnation or sin or guilt. We are free. But as a believer, if we continue to live in guilt and condemnation and shame from time to time, that means we have not understood or we have fully not experienced the reality of our life in Christ or who we are in Christ or our identity in Christ. Okay, Because if a believer, as a believer, if we feel condemned all the time, we have not understood our life in Christ. And we're still living life from the Old Testament law, 
or under the law mentality. And what is happening? That is when we are always feeling judged, we are feeling condemned, and we are feeling accused. But when we understand our life in Christ, we know that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And he says in um, verse um, 2, if you look at verse 2, he says, these people who are in Christ, you know, they do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So if you are in Christ, you are not walking according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now this, this phrase to walk, or these two words to walk, Paul often uses this in his letters, right? Or his epistles. He says in Galatians that we need to walk in the <laughs> in the spirit, you have to walk in the spirit. And in Corinthians, he says, walk in the faith. Yes, walk in the faith. So he's basically saying how we need to live life, how we need to conduct, conduct our lives, that we need to walk or we need to live or we need to conduct ourselves not according to the flesh, but in accordance to or in alignment with or in subjection to the uh, to the spirit and not to the flesh. Okay. So he says we are not to live in accordance, in alignment, in subjection to the flesh. Because we are not dictated or controlled by the flesh, but we are under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And we are not under the influence of the flesh. So when you feel like giving into temptation or you're giving into your weaknesses of your flesh, you need to stop and tell yourself, hey, I am in Christ. I'm not walking or living according to the flesh. I'm living according to the spirit. And the flesh is no longer controlling me or dictating me or I'm no longer under the influence of the flesh. So he says, this is how we need to live. We need to live habitual lives, you know, uh, uh, living in alignment, in subjection, in influence and direction and leading of the Holy Spirit. So we can pray this in our prayer, saying, God, <clears throat> help me to live under the subjection, influence, direction, leading of the Spirit, in alignment with the Spirit and not in subjection and alignment and direction to my flesh. You can pray that every day. So in Galatians chapter 5, he talks of what it means to live in a spirit. It's a beautiful chapter where he talks about the deeds of the flesh, the fruit of the spirit. And in Ephesians chapter 5, he talks about living the spirit-filled life. Okay. And the same thing in Colossians chapter 3. Okay. So these are parallel chapters. Okay. And uh, Col uh, Colossians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, Romans chapter 8, all of these parallel chapters, they are reiterating the same truth, uh, you know, but to different audiences to, uh, and brings out different facets of life in the spirit. But we can all study all of this in parallel. Okay. So in Romans chapter 8, he says, walk according to the spirit. And what does he say when you walk according to the spirit? What happens when you walk according to the Spirit? You will not fulfill the desires or the, uh, the, the lust of the flesh. Okay? Verse 2, it says, For the law of Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So it says, The law of the Spirit of life and the law of sin and death. These are terms that we've already used earlier, looked at earlier. In he's, he's spoken about this in uh, verse 23 of Romans chapter 7, where he says, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So here he's referring to the law of sin in the members that is in my body. And he says, the law of sin, which is in an influence, a control, a dominion uh, of sin in my 
body and he uh, and he also repeats this in in verse 25 where of Romans chapter 7 where he says I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God but with the flesh the law of sin which means he's saying my flesh is subject to the law of sin it's subject to the control and dominion and influence of sin the natural evil desires of my soul and body is controlled by sin but when he comes to romans 8 2 he says for the law of the spirit of life he's saying he's not referring to the old testament law but it means the law of the spirit of life means the control the dominion the influence of the spirit of life that means the control the dominion the influence of the holy spirit that gives life notice here he says the holy spirit is a spirit of what verse 2 holy spirit is a spirit of hello are you all with me or oh, you're in wonderland la la land what does he say look at verse 2 the holy spirit he calls it as the spirit of yeah life Yes, the spirit of life. Thank you. So what Paul is saying here is very intentional. You know, we already saw in chapter 7, he says the law of sin produces what? The law of sin produces what? Yes. Death. But the law of spirit of life brings what? The law of spirit of life gives what? The law of sin gives death. The law of the spirit of life gives what? Life. life. What yes. kind of life? Yes, what kind of life? Zoe life, the eternal life. Okay. So the control, the dominion, the influence of the spirit of life sets me free from the control, the dominion, the influence of sin, which is producing death, both spiritual and physical. But the spirit of life is setting me free from that control and the dominion, that influence of sin and death. Isn't that beautiful the way that he is? bringing about these truths the way he's presenting these truths to us, okay? So in Romans chapter 2, he is giving us the answer to the struggle that he is mentioned in Romans chapter 7. Remember, we listed out all the struggles he mentions in Romans chapter 7? Yes or no, you remember? You're looking blank at me. Remember the struggles we listed out in Romans chapter 7? It's in your notes. Yes? Yes. You know, he says, I'm doing what I'm, I, 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 you know, what I'm doing, I do not understand what I, I will to do, I do not practice, what I hate, I do, what I don't want to do the good, and, and, I, and I, I'm unable to do that. All of those things that he's already presented, okay, uh, the struggles, now he's saying, this is the answer. So what is the answer Paul is saying? What is the answer? Come on, what is the answer? When the eye is replaced by the Spirit of God, when He is the one who leads us in in life, in life that is according to life and peace. I mean, it goes on, I think, those verses which says. Okay. So what is, thank you, Nina. What is the answer Paul is saying? To all the struggles that he's presented in verse 7, the law of sin and death says the Holy Spirit, the spirit of life sets me free from the control, the power and the dominion that sin is producing in me. The Holy Spirit, the spirit of life sets me free. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> it's good to ask questions. I, you know, otherwise you'll, you'll understand what I'm saying. Yes. So he's presenting all the struggles, talking about the law of sin and death. He's giving us the answer. What is the answer? Holy Spirit. The Spirit of life sets us free from the control of sin and death. Amen? Okay, if there are no questions. We'll end class. Thank you, everyone. Have a blessed day. I'll see you next week. All of you Romans, till then live with that powerful truths that we study in Romans. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.